joining us now on the constitutionality of the health care law is Carl Mannheim, constitutional scholar and professor of law at Loyola Law School. Professor Mannheim is in Los Angeles. Sir, welcome to Bloomberg's Bottom Line. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, Professor, opponents of the health care law say that the federal requirement that individuals obtain health insurance or face a penalty oversteps the authority the Constitution gives Congress to regulate interstate commerce. Is that argument valid? I don't believe so. I think it's a radical decision both by uh, Judge Hudson in Virginia and Judge Vinson in Florida. Uh, we need to put this in a kind of a historical context. This is a states' rights argument that uh, we've been str struggling over in this country since our founding over 200 years ago. Uh, the question really uh, boils down to whether a matter such as uh, health insurance, which is nationwide in scope, is within the competence within the competence of Congress, or whether each state must deal with it individually. Right. Uh, Health care is the um, largest sector of the U.S. economy, consuming about 17 percent of our GDP, three or four times the size of the military. And to say that this is not a matter of national concern, that each state has to deal with it or can opt out separately, really returns us to uh, kind of an economic world that existed in the 18th century. Uh, so we have been fighting these states' rights arguments for over 200 years. We actually fought them on the battlefield. That's what the Civil War was all about. Right. Uh, and this is just a resurrection of uh, the, uh, the old states' rights, southern rights uh, argument. I don't think it's going to survive appeal. In his ruling, uh, Judge Vinson wrote, quoting here, Congress could require that people buy and consume broccoli at regular intervals. And he said not only because uh, the required purchases will positively impact interstate commerce, but also because people who eat healthier tend to be healthier and are thus more productive and put less of a strain on the health care system. And he did continue here again, quoting, if Congress can penalize a passive individual for failing to engage in commerce, the enumeration of powers in the Constitution would have been in vain. Is that a fair analogy? Well, th this is a common technique we use in law school. It's known as the slippery slope argument. <laughs> uh, w when, whenever, whenever you uh, argue uh, an absurd extreme, such as the broccoli example, uh, then you're just, you know, you're, you're, you're kind of preordaining your, your conclusion. Um, look, the economy, the American economy has uh, changed uh, in 225 years. Uh, back in uh, 1787, when the Constitution was written, we pretty much had local markets. There are no such things as local markets anymore. Probably not even national markets. Everything's international in scope. And to say that con Congress has the same powers in 2011 that it had in 1787 is just silly. Uh, this is a really radical um, uh, opinion. Now, the, the broccoli analogy is, is a silly one as well. Uh, what uh, Judge Vincent said is that uh, not buying insurance uh, is, an, is not an activity at all. It's inactivity. But, of course, people who don't buy insurance are really engaged in an economic act of their own. They are, they are self-insuring. Uh, everybody who has a deductible on their auto policy or their homeowner's policy, they're self-insuring for that amount. And to say that that's not an economic act, right. uh, I mean, I think that's putting form over substance. Uh, so Congress clearly has this power. Whether it's wise uh, to use it, I, I think there are a lot of things in the uh, health care bill that are, are bad policy. Right. Part, parts of it are probably unconstitutional. Constitutional, but not for the reasons that Judge uh, Vinson and uh, Judge Hudson are, are stating in their opinions. Well, this is likely going to end up before the U.S. Supreme Court. And during confirmation hearings, many justices spoke of their respect for stare decisis, settled law or settled precedent. Is that the case here? Is there settled precedent for this? Oh, of course. I mean, we go back uh, um, to the early 19th century when um, the great Chief Justice John Marshall talked about the expansive powers of Congress. Uh, and uh, virtually every case that the Supreme Court has heard, uh, at least since the 1930s, uh, has upheld uh, Congress's power under the Commerce Clause. There are some notable exceptions where there's not even an attenuated connection to commerce. But to say that uh, health care is not a matter of interstate commerce uh, is to put your head in the sand. Uh, so this is an artificial distinction between activity and inactivity. It's one that's not found in the case law and one that an economist would dispute. As I said, uh, self-insuring, self -insuring, uh, bearing your own risk for future health care costs, uh, certainly an economic act. Um, before we let you go in about 30 seconds, I was uh, just checking my Bloomberg terminal and somebody uh, wrote me and said that uh, we should uh, mention that... Uh, in each state, you have local insurance commissioners, and they regulate. So, in a sense, 
Is, is, is that fair? Well, so it's an in interesting history here. Uh, about 70 or 80 years ago, the Supreme Court said that the states could not regulate the business of insurance because it was interstate in character, and only Congress could. Uh, and uh, following that decision, Congress passed a law known as the McCarran-Ferguson Act, which um, uh, delegated the powers back to the state. So the reason the states have local insurance commissioners and the ability to, to regulate insurance is because Congress has given them that power. Yeah. Uh, without that, uh, this would be purely a federal affair. All right, Professor Carl Mannheim, Loyola Law School, joining us from Los Angeles. Professor, thank you so much. We appreciate your time.